The Bane Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, newly uncovered secret tome reveals that the pulp novel came first. Time travelers send a paperback science fiction novel and a turtle back in time. Something goes wrong, and that's where hardcovers come from. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's uncompromising honor. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. We have an interview with Larry Correa and John D. Brown this time, talking about a new science fiction novel by Larry Correa and John Brown that is called Gun Runner. And this is the first novel length science fiction for either of these guys. It's really good. This there is adventure, there is shooting, there are mech battles, some Titanic ones, and an excellent premise with lots of cool ideas. Good science fiction, great Larry Korea storytelling, and John D. Brown. And Larry and John will tell us all about it. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Honor Harrington series masterpiece, Uncompromising Honor. Now, here's the news. Hey, you have two more days, so grab these discounts. To honor the publication of The Macedonian Hazard, Bainey Books has big discounts this month on several Eric Flint time-twisting series. This month, we have $2 off The Alexander Inheritance by Eric Flint, Gorg Huff, and Paula Goodlook, the prequel to The Macedonian Hazard, which is out this month, plus $1 off Time Spike by Eric Flint and Marilyn Kosmatka. And discounts on the complete Arcane America series co-created by Eric Flint, uh, $2 off Council of Fire by Eric Flint and Walter H. Hunt, and $1 off Uncharted by Kevin J. Anderson and Sarah A. Hoyt. Finally, also a dollar off on Color of Lightning by Peter J. Wax and Eitan Collin. Get these discounts by Sunday midnight at all online booksellers while January time stays twisted. And starting just after that, the Bain February hardcovers and trade paperbacks are hitting booksellers at the speed of speed reading or slow reading or whatever reading speed you do, even an ad mixture. What's the difference between a mixture and an ad mixture? I do not know, but at booksellers is Gunrunner by Larry Correa and John D. Brown. Once Jackson Rook was a war hero, now he's a smuggler. His mission, still a top-of-the-line mech and deliver it to the far-flung planet of Swindle. But for all Rook's mercenary ways, there is a sense of tough, rough justice within him. And it seems that deep within the smuggler, the heart of a warrior still beats. Also out in February is Tiger Bright by T.C. McCarthy. Sam Kiar is a novitiate within a secret holy order tasked by fleet to infiltrate the home world of mankind's most dangerous enemy, the Somnin. If caught, her mission will bring war to Earth long before humanity is ready to confront this implacable enemy. Finally out now is The Jupiter Knife by DJ Butler and Aaron Michael Ritchie. A dark and ancient conspiracy is afoot in a small town set amid endless hills of warped and twisted sandstone. Local law enforcement seems powerless to stop a murderous magic from claiming victim after victim. Unraveling the plot will require a man of skill, a man equally at ease with magic and reason. A good man, a man of humility, but also a cunning man. The Jupiter Knife by DJ Butler and Aaron Michael Ritchie, Tiger Bright by TC McCarthy, and Gun Runner by Larry Correa and John D. Brown are available at booksellers everywhere. Hey, I want to welcome Larry Correa and John D. Brown to the podcast. Hi, guys. Hey. Hey, thanks for having us. Well, Larry Correa, as everyone should know by now, is the creator of the Wall Street Journal and New York Times bestselling Monster Hunter series with first entry Monster Hunter International, as well as 
Urban Fantasy Hardbold Adventure Saga, Grimnor Chronicles, uh, one of my personal favorites with uh, the first entry, Hard Magic there and, and epic fantasy series, The Saga of the Forgotten Warrior. That was the last, uh, what was the, the not House of Assassins, what's the last book? Uh, Destroyer of Worlds. Destroyer of Worlds, yeah, that was excellent, uh, excellent third entry in that. And uh, what else we say with the, yeah, Son of the Black Sword, latest century House of Assassins is not right. It is Destroyer of Worlds. He's an avid gun user. That is Larry, an advocate who shot on a competitive level for many years. Before becoming a full-time writer, he was a military contract accountant and a small business accountant and manager. Um, Larry lives in Utah with his wife and family. John D. Brown writes action-packed thrillers and epic fantasies. He also lives in Utah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with characters you want to cheer for, he currently lives with his wife and four daughters in the hinterlands of Utah, where one encounters much fresh air, many good-hearted ranchers, and the occasional wolf. <laughs> so out now at booksellers everywhere is um, this excellent collaboration called Gunrunner. Um, and here's a Here's a picture of it, and here's another uh, 3D image of it that's actually real, just sitting in my hands. Um, Gunrunner is out of booksellers everywhere, and this is science fiction, which is um, an interesting, uh, interesting thing for Larry, although um, not unheard of that he would write it. Uh, but it's a, it's a it's a interesting step. And uh, John, you've been writing thrillers up till now. Is that uh, Thrillers and epic fantasy. That's right. And epic fantasy. So what what possessed you guys to get together and write science fiction? How did the conception of this thing start? Uh, John, you want to take this? Because I think it's kind yeah, of... Yeah, yeah, sure. It was originally John's idea, to, to this, not the book, but the project. But so, yeah, go ahead, man. So what happened is there's um, an annual... Uh, science fiction and fantasy convention out here in Utah called Life, the Universe, and Everything. And Larry and I had done presentations for them before about how to write. It's it's more of a, a writer's convention than it is a fan's convention. So there's a lot of stuff there about how to write. And they I, I pitched to them the idea that uh, we would do how to write an action plot. And Larry and I would do that together. And so normally, and we wanted to have audience participation, but normally you don't have enough time in these things. If you start totally from scratch, there's just no way you have enough time to get into it. And we were wanting to do plotting. So we already had to have characters and a situation and a setting, et cetera. So uh, I went over to Larry's house and I said, okay, we got to get some of this story together so that we can show them how to do an action plot. And we're sitting there in his house uh, uh, on his couches across from each other. And at the time, his son, Joe, how old was he, Larry? Like 11, 10? No, he was like nine. Yeah, because he's nine? 16 now. So yeah. <laughs> okay. So or he's 10, nine yeah, years nine old. And he's over there listening in, right? Down on the stairs, you can see his head popping up. And I said, okay, so what do we want to do? What, what kind of an action plot? It's got to be fantasy, science fiction. And Larry says, hey, Joe, what's cool? And Joe pops up and says, giant robots, bandits, and murderers. <laughs> so Larry and I are like, that does sound cool, man. So 40 minutes later, we had the, the seed or the idea for this story. And it was all just for that conference. And so we took it to the conference and brainstormed with them about plot things and taught them about action and, and plot and story there. And then, uh, and then it just sat there. You know, we thought, oh man, this would make a great story, but it just sat there. And then sometime later, Larry, what happened? Tony contacted you? Well, I've, I've had a pretty good track record of um, having collaborations with other authors and uh, I've done a bunch now. And uh, the last one went really well. And so Tony Weisskopf came to me and she's like, hey, do you have any other collaborative ideas and any authors you'd like to team up with? And uh, there was two, but the very first thing I thought of was that that panel that we had done where we, you know, spent two hours basically outlining the book in front of a live studio audience. And I was like, yeah, I got her getting done with that, looking at you and thinking, this is really good. We could write the crap out of this. This would be a good book. Yeah. And uh, so I immediately pitched that to Tony. And then I went, then I went back to John. I was like, hey, John, by the way, 
<laughs> you want to write a science fiction novel for Bane real fast? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, yeah. So it, it had a weird way it came about, and um, it's kind of fun. So, in, in fact, uh, something that my son did before we did this, while so while the forty minutes while we were there coming up all the characters and basic plot at my house, my son started drawing pictures of the giant fighting robots. And uh, so we actually took one of the giant fighting robots and we stuck it as an illustration as drawn by a 10 year old and stuck it at the back of the book. Uh, just kind of there for the Genesis. It's, it's just, it's cute. Yeah. <laughs> the inspiration. The, did he draw the Citadel or was it uh, the spider? It or... was the Citadel. Well, he drew both. Because ah. We actually, we came up with the spider the very first thing. Cause he went, I think the spider robot was his idea. If I remember right. And so it was just too cool to have that fight at the end. So he drew both, but the one that, that John still had on file was the Citadel, which at the time, actually, I think it had a different name. Uh, oh, oh, it was the Hunter, but we couldn't call it that because I'm all known for the Monster Hunter series. And I was like, well, I can't have too many things featuring the name Hunter. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so Citadel actually came from my, my little son, who is now, he's nine now, who was just a baby then. And so I was like, hey, uh and jake what's a good name for uh what's a good name for a giant fighting robot and he's like citadel i was like that's a good name actually <laughs> now we know where larry gets all his that's ideas right. he's just talking to his kids hey people want to know idea? where you get your idea i need another monster hunter <laughs> book <laughs> she's moved out and she's a published writer now too so uh, she's got she's minding her own ideas <laughs> yeah. maybe she'll just start asking you for some at larry and you'll be and you'll ask like your sons and it'll all <laughs> Come full circle. I just give her so. my second tier stuff. I save oh. the good stuff for you guys. Oh, I see. Well, <laughs> thanks. Um, so, how did the collaboration process work beyond just that that panel you did? Um, nope, Larry's look. Just like we lost a little bit. There you go. He's back. I think we lost Tony. Or, oh, I, I'm, there. I'm there. I didn't hear Tony. How did the collaboration me. process go beyond just the panel? Um, uh well so that's how it started and then and then like several years nothing happened because we were both writing our own books um uh because when i first uh when i first met john and uh many years ago we were both starting out and at the time he was writing epic fantasy um and we toured around the country together we we paid our own way and did these mega road trip book tours um so we knew each other pretty well we knew our we knew our creative processes pretty well and so then, you know, fast forward years later, we had this idea. And so Tony asked me if I want to do any more collaborations with anybody. And I thought of John and uh, then the actual writing process, we got together again and we did uh, some more serious brainstorming. We actually came up with a, a pretty solid outline we sent back and forth. Uh, we had to do a lot of world building and we actually had to do a lot of world building on the fly too, because like we had their background things, but neither one of us had like really thought it through. And then John actually did the rough draft, the initial rough draft uh, pass with John. And then he came back to me. So I did this, the, the next draft and then sent it back to John and then back and forth. And then I did the final, final edits and that was it. So it was, it was a, it was a ping pong ball of a collaboration. A did you guys of, find the, uh, the, the, the creation of science fiction world a somewhat different process than creation of fantasy world? Or is it just sort of the same thing with, with, for me, um, well, I'll just say this. For me, the, the only thing that was different was that, I, you know, Larry, I don't, for me, it just wasn't that different. It was just that I had to think about scientific things and extrapolate those types of things and the ramifications of that versus fantasy type things. It was all a matter of, well, what, what could it be like? And it was instead of a a fantasy and epic fantasy kingdom or set of kingdoms or stuff like that it was multiple worlds and planets so for me the uh the process was similar i felt it was just a sim different topic matter yeah uh, I, but i want to go back and say something i need to say this uh you know larry talked about that collaboration process and i uh i don't know how other collaborations work but i have to say one thing that i really appreciated was that it wasn't uh, and it wasn't a here's my idea, John. Now go be a, a typewriter monkey and write it. 
it truly was what do you think is cool here's what i think is cool give me more whatever you think is cool and we tried to take as many cool things as we both thought up and put it together and of course larry is the lead writer on this was just so open to it and so i i just have to say i i i was thoroughly uh pleased surprised and pleased because i had understood collaborations worked a little bit differently just the amount of input and the the willingness he had to incorporate whatever ideas i had some of them didn't work <laughs> some of, some of i know them you still love a, bruce a you still love far. bruce he's gonna he's gonna show up again there's something someday i know yes he just didn't work this time <laughs> <laughs> yeah this uh anyway so we'll get back to i just have to we'll get back to this other thing so that for me the process was i i just do what i normally did it was just a different topic matter building out the world and making sure things made sense to us that was me i don't know larry what was yeah it different i agree because it's, it's funny because the difference between fantasy world building and sci-fi world building really was uh instead of magic it was technology really and and, and we had some things we had to really hammer out technology wise like what the technology level was just because it really affected the story um we had quite a few discussions early on about um things like um like, like how the travel works how the communication works yeah. because that, you're that very specific that about t talking about how the the gates work for instance in the book yeah it is actually interesting it's because on the, the story. original draft uh a lot of the stuff we kind of john and i kind of hand waved because we were just like, okay, this is a kind of a normal sci-fi trope that you use either, you know, faster than light travel this way or this way. And we kind of picked one. We went with it because we thought it worked good for the story with the whole smuggling angle. Uh, it was actually then Tony Weisskopf when she did her edits. When it went to Tony, she very specifically, the stuff that she wanted, the biggest changes we had to make to this uh, were actually world building ones where she wanted more uh, blatant explanations of certain items earlier in the book. Um, and she was saying, she's like, the, and she, used to, she said this too. She's like, she said it to me and John. She's like, you guys are, your background is fantasy writers. You just got to realize that sci fi writers come to expect a certain amount more explanation of what the technology <laughs> level is, you know, yeah. early. So, so she wanted you to David Weberize it, is what you're saying. That's <laughs> we did that a little bit but i i can't david weberize that good true story and i think you were actually the guy doing the interview so one time me and david did an interview for um an anthology we're both in the liberty con anthology and what it was is both of us were supposed to read from our stories uh and we had the same amount of time to read our stories and uh, i read my whole story and then david read the intro to his story <laughs> right yeah 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 that's that's david though that's his nature i'm i'm more programmed as a thriller guy i, I even my epic fantasy stuff's pace fast and then john is the same way because he writes um his stuff is quick i mean it's try it it, it just yeah. moves well scene, there's, scene, there's scene, a lot scene. of there's a lot of cool sf ideas in here but it also i mean this is this is a really a, a fast-paced uh, adventure story so let's talk about that let's talk about jackson in particular because everything really is about jackson rook um, this is his, uh, this is his tale um, of what happens to him and, and it, it sort of springs from his character. So maybe we can uh, start talking about who he is and, and where, how he came to be uh, at Swindle and, and that sort of thing. Sure. Uh, John, go ahead. You. Uh, well, you know, I think the core concept is that Jackson was a child soldier. He was forced into battle at a, a, at a young age. And for whatever reason, he had an ability to be able to, to, to merge with the wetware that they had, et cetera, with mechs that other people might not have been able to do. So here and he is. And this was on the world of, uh, of Gloss, right? It's not That's the world that takes place. So he grew up in this other, uh, and the galaxy's been settled. We, we should probably set up the galaxy a little bit here. And, and so, but there's still people that know about Earth and there's an America. So it's not, it, where are we and how are we perhaps before we start talking about Jackson completely? Um, yeah. so, so it makes more sense. So I, I think I think what we wanted to do is we didn't want to project this out to like the year 3000, because at that point in time, either you've got to go dystopia or the, the technology is so far advanced. It's, you might as well be doing magic anyway, right? So we said probably some somewhere between now and the year uh, 2100, 
somebody's or, or maybe around that time somebody's going to discover this gate technology and they develop it and so even though they've gone out to the stars and they've gone and explored different places it's taken some time Larry, I can't remember how many worlds we finally ended up with. Was it like we, 12? We, we detailed about 30 colonized 30? ones with a whole bunch more they were working on. So, so yeah, so it isn't like Star Trek where we're everywhere and there are hundreds and hundreds of worlds. They're still in an exploration phase. And uh, that was one of the things that we did a lot of work on is trying to figure out how did that happen? How did all the countries in the United States get together to do that? Um, so one of these worlds is gloss and and the, the situation there is we have a collectivist um, government that is trying to take over the everybody that's out there the colonies that are out there on gloss and jackson lives in one of the ones that's rebelling and fighting back and so that, that's kind of his story and he's he's a child soldier he's he's impressed into into service and that's where he starts except things go south pretty fast for him yeah that yeah it's the intro is so like um so on the different worlds one of the things we did is uh we would have like different cultural influences on different planets or basically the idea was so they you know park colony ship somewhere over earth and load it up with you know whoever was trying to get off from that area and that's who's going to that world so like the naming conventions and most of gloss that either wound up being kind of pseudo scottish english or german uh it was just kind of jackson's home world and then uh swindle uh or actually the, the real name of swindle the planet the most of this story takes place is lush was what they originally named it because it was false advertising uh yeah. and most of the settlers that came from there were basically lush <laughs> yeah it was actually the real name was lush the, that's what the survey company called it and it's beautiful and they had pictures of how beautiful it is and it really is a, a, an epic awe-inspiring planet that everything on it wants to kill you, including the air. <laughs> like this planet sucks. It is, it is the worst planet ever, and no one in their right mind would try to live there. But but they they sold it, and so the colonists there mostly came from a selection we had. Basically, whatever war torn country in the third world had a refugee pri crisis at the time, that's where they loaded up colonists from. Uh, they sent them to Lush, or, and the, the the people call it Swindle though, because that's what it is. So it was a swindle. Um, so Jackson, uh, so after he leaves Gloss, he actually gets evacuated off of Gloss by one of our other main characters, who's the captain of a, a smuggling vessel. Uh, the Holloway. collectivist one. I mean, he, oh, yeah. and on, yeah. on his Big world time. and he's, uh, he was part of the losing rebellion and, and, uh, he got really messed up in the process too. And I don't want to give away too much because yeah, part this, of the, part of the technology twist, yeah. was, yeah. human beings can plug directly into uh various machines uh because it's kind of a synergistic effect basically is what we came up with so instead of uh, just a machine doing a machine thing or a human doing a human thing machines could do things a lot more quickly and efficiently but a human could do it more creatively uh and also instinctually which uh when you put the two together you get a synergistic effect and jackson was one of the best people at that ever um, and he got smuggled off this planet during the fall. I don't want to say too much what happened to him, but so the last few years he's been on this crew of smugglers. And, and part of the, the idea with this crew is the captain actually, he's not just a thief and a pirate. He's actually got kind of got a code. Uh, he's from earth originally he's from North Carolina specifically. Um, he's very much a man of honor and that he is very big on, uh, what's the antithesis of gun control. And so anywhere in the galaxy where there's people who aren't allowed to have things to protect themselves, he gets them those things and he gets paid well doing it. And so this crew, they go around basically stealing advanced weapon systems and smuggling them to planets and people that aren't supposed to have them. And so that's, that's when we join our crew and get onto our main adventures. They go to the planet swindle. Um, it was a fun bunch. I, I really had a, it was, it was a fun crew. Yeah. So we, I mean, we start with them stealing this thing um, to, so they're sort of, sort of interplanetary, interstellar Robin Hoods that that do well. Kind of, <laughs> but they get paid. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess a lot of people that run guns probably think of themselves as Robin Hoods, but they get paid. So, but the, so uh, they, um, they, it, our, our initial, uh, very thrilling opening is Jackson stealing this thing or getting it, or he's stealing it. <laughs> and, 
And he's surrounded by all these little uh, droids and things. And he's hooked up with um, this wonderful character, Jane, who is, um, who's a, a amazing hacker type on the ship. Um, and all of this is going on at once. Maybe since that, you know, that is just the opening, we could talk about that a lot um, and talk about how all that works. Cause that's the, the fun of the book carries through from that um, because there's Fifi and, and just a little, Let's give a picture, perhaps. I think, I think the original idea for Jane came from John. John you came up with Jane originally, right? Uh, spe- yeah, and her name then I think was Spectre, right? We wanted, we wanted somebody doing the, uh, the calling the shots from up above, right? Like, uh, like one of those Spectre A one ships, somebody calling them down, and she was controlling that. Yeah, so she is an awesome character. So what we did with her is she's she's actually kind of. Um, I don't want to give too much away in spoilers, but basically she comes from the most advanced planet uh, that mankind has settled. And it's basically kind of a land of, um, well, not even the whole land, but they have one area of this world that's basically a land of mad scientists, right? And um, so Jane's background is she's basically an escaped genetic experiment. Um, She is fundamentally designed from the ground up to be what they refer to as a combat controller. Uh, for their army so basically her job is to operate all the system or coordinate all the systems and little killer robots lots and lots of little killer robots um and uh, jane jane escapes this and it's not a it's not a pleasant place and actually i got some i expect some easter eggs in there that tie into one of my other series but uh, no one's caught those yet so i'm not gonna say anything um but yeah, no, so Jane, Jane has run away basically and joined the crew of the Tar Heel. She's, she's part of the smuggling crew. And her, her job is she's the, she's the main basically information warfare officer on the ship. She's the person that coordinates all their heists. And, uh, but she is, she, she is a hacking machine. And also she is probably the most dangerous person on the whole crew. And the thing is, all her little robots that she has that she builds for fun. Um, like little bears with chainsaw arms and stuff. She makes them all cute. Um, so, so I don't know. I think I think we came up with that. So we started making all the robots like real chibi, you know, like like little jet jet animation, like super cute. Uh, and so they've all got names. And Fifi's a Fifi's a recurring character. Uh, Fifi's this little pea sized robot, little little robot that just goes around doing chores basically. And but Fifi is so lethal. <laughs> Yeah. Give a little pea sized robot a laser. Don't don't mess with Fifi. Yeah. <laughs> Fifi will just scalpel open your neck, man. She is <laughs> no Jane's one of my favorite characters. She she, she was she was actually a lot of fun. Uh, I really enjoyed writing her. And Jackson's movie. Jackson's totally in love with her. Um and oh yeah, totally. But uh in fact she's probably the only girl he could love given who he is. But um it's just not gonna get reciprocated um at least things will have to change dramatically if it ever yeah, she's got she's got some issues to work through yeah, <laughs> yeah. so does he <laughs> oh yeah yeah so that's why they, that's why those well, two work well kind of a crew of misfits in a way right there's the captain there's some uh, and there's Tui, the big uh the big fellow who can crush you um tell us <laughs> tell us about him he's he's uh, what, Minoan? What is he? He's, he's Samoan. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Tui actually. He's a philosopher. Of- he's a thinker at the and a cool, like chill guy who could crush you instantly. He's one of the. He's one of the, actually the first characters John and I came up with when we were brainstorming this, uh, because one of the things we wanted to have was like a, basically a boarding party slash you know basically the, the, the trigger pullers of the crew. Because Jackson is not a Jackson fights with robots, right? And Jane is a hacker, right? She, uh, and we need a tr- we need some trigger pullers uh, for this. And so we came up with Tui originally. And the thing about him is he is the scariest dude ever, and he's actually genetically modified too because he's former military. Uh, uh, he was a, he was a he was a combat soldier on I believe it. Yeah, he was from Earth, and um, and so he he's been he's been modified for combat. Like he has reinforced bones uh you know he has nanites in his bloodstream to help him heal faster he can like john called it the monkey uh the monkey mods the the monkey genes basically i mean the dude the dude is like super strong and dangerous but he also um we made him like uh 
he's he's devoutly religious and just a really nice guy. He's just a, he's just a swell guy, and he's kind of like he kind of takes on like the older brother part for Jackson. And it, we, as we get into the story, we find out this because too we actually had a little brother that he lost, uh, and so he's kind of taking Jackson under his wing as his little brother. Because uh, you know, Tui's Tui's older, experienced, been around, been there, done that. Uh, just a great guy. But like you know, he got his he got a philosophy degree. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, he's just a great character. I, I love that guy. You know, what did you call the... his tats, John? What was that? What did you call his tats? Oh, crazy pants of the ancestors. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Because all those traditional tats that the the Samoans do, right, and and those uh, Islanders do. And, and we just love, I, I uh, you know, I've, I've worked with uh, folks from the islands and there's a great community here in Utah. And I think we were just, we thought it'd be awesome to, to have somebody like that in the story. I had, a, I had when I was on a, uh, a mission for my church, one of my companions was from Hawaii and, and had some of that ancestry in, in him. Uh, one of the things that I think is interesting when we were thinking this up, was that uh, we had know, to have a crew. Just, we wanted a crew. I just had a picture of Tui coming around as a Mormon missionary, and I would convert if he <laughs> told me it was necessary. <laughs> you'd, you'd be like, uh, sure, whatever you say, man. Yes, Tui. <laughs> yeah. anyway. um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, one of the things that was interesting way back when, when we were doing the uh, when we were doing the conference, the the workshop at that at that uh, science fiction and fantasy convention is we have a team. And so there's a lot of different ways that you could figure out how to have a team and how to work the cast, but you always want to have differences in the characters. You don't want the cast to be all the same. And at that time, Larry's like, hey, let's just do a five man band. And, and so we did the five man band. We mixed up the roles and changed them a little bit, but that's part of how we came up with why do we need somebody like Tui? You know, what's Jackson? Oh, he's going to be, he's going to be the, uh, uh, he's got his role. Jane has her role. And so it was a, an interesting way, an interesting trope to use and then start tweaking just to have fun with it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah then that kind of like fell out when we had to start nailing down just what the, what the, how big the crew was. Uh, and so that expanded dramatically but we still had just kind of the, the, the main core group is what we used for most of the story but we had to add more boarding party people that actually became like uh pretty major characters that had quite a bit of stuff to do yeah uh cat cat and bushy um they wound up in there a lot and they were just like minor characters to start and they went up in there a lot we had to add more characters as we went because we we're like oh well what's the ship gonna do with this oh i guess we actually need someone to do that all right <laughs> Yeah. And Larry had Larry had this list of all of these, what what do you call them? The cherry red shirt names? Oh yeah, charity red. Okay, so I do these things where I do charity things where if you donate money, I think last time we had like like two hundred bucks. If you donated two hundred bucks, uh, it was actually we paid for a guy's spinal surgery, uh, and the one before this we paid for a kid's uh, kidney dialysis and took to get a get a transplant. So my fans will kick in money and they give just give me their name and a brief description of themselves. And then I try to work, then I work them into a book and they might just be on one paragraph. They might show up and die horribly, or they might wind up with a great big role, you know, then they've lived for a long time. But this last time I got so, it was so popular that I actually had hundreds of names. So when we, we paid for the whole surgery, right? Um, great, yeah. It was awesome. But the thing is, I've been using the same list of names for like the last four years trying to get through them. So I gave John this big list. I was like, here, John. Like every, everybody everybody who is in space <laughs> they are on this list <laughs> well and so a lot of the, a lot of these characters are from the charity red shirt list and, and what was cool is that i, I there were they you know they would put in little things about themselves and of course they had their own names i i don't know that i would ever come up with these names on my own or these little background things about them. i think jink jeep prunkard was was one of them he oh, has yeah. this big dog, so he shows up. It's this great character, this nasty dude with this big old nasty dog. But that just came from Larry's red shirt list, right? Yeah, and, and actually, the guy has the best bad guy space pirate name ever. His name is Jeet Prunkard. Yeah, and I was like, that is a perfect 
space pirate name. Holy crap. Uh, Sam Fain, uh, who is one of the main, he's like the, the main bad guy's right hand man. Yeah. He's... It was funny. So I saw him on, or so I, I was posting about this book the other day and I see this guy posting and he's like, yeah, I haven't read this. I was like, well, dude, yeah, I, you're on the red shirt list. You because you're like one of the main villains who gets the best faction fight scenes. And he's like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah, you better hurry up and read it. <laughs> Lucky Sam. Yeah. Well, all right. So they steal the Citadel uh, at the beginning of the book uh, with, with a little bit of worry and trouble <laughs> and, and near death experiences. And, uh, and, and what is the Citadel and what are they going to do with it? And let's start talking a little bit about the war, about warlord. Not the oh, sure. warlord, warlord. <laughs> so, yeah, warlord. Um, yeah. Okay, so this, so the way we set this up, there's a bunch of different types of advanced weapon systems, but we wanted to do a story about mechs. And part of the thing about the idea of a mech, you know, a walking battle robot, realistically, like on Earth, that would struggle, uh, even with advanced technology, because tall things are easier to kill than short things. The more higher you stick up over the horizon, the easier you are to blast. Wow, However, Larry, you must be very vulnerable. <laughs> oh yeah, no. I, in combat, I'd be the first one shot. I mean, I'm six five. I everybody else just hide behind me and use me as a meat sandbag. Mm -hmm. But um, so the idea was we needed to design when we designed Swindle, we needed an environment where mechs would shine, where you couldn't use a tracked vehicle um, like a tank. And so Swindle is like super rough terrain, and and very very rugged. And has he, they has these giant trees that grow everywhere. Um, and, and super rough terrain. So it's almost impossible. And, and the ground, it rains constantly and it's muddy and there's lightning strikes and the air is poisonous. But um, there, there's a colony there. And so most people actually live on orbitals around the place. But Swindle is home to an extremely valuable resource in it that has this really valuable resource on the surface that grows there. It's a biological process that grows in the trees and the great trees that live there. And it's a very valuable compound that's used in gate manufacture. And it occurs in a few places in the galaxy, but Swindle has the best reliable supply. Problem is, um, the surface of Swindle is super inhospitable for humans. So the settlers live in these giant orbitals around the planet. And then they go down in teams of harvesters for a couple of days of time, harvest as much of the, of the CX as they can, and they fly out. Uh, and the thing is, the wildlife on Swindle is all super vicious and gigantic. So they have all sorts of different kinds of horrible, horrible monsters. And the best weapons to defend the teams of harvesters are mechs. So they use these, uh, because the mechs can walk around anything and they can jump from tree to tree. Tracked vehicles suck on Swindle. And so, but Swindle, because it's an independent colony, is not allowed to have these advanced war machines. So the crew has been smuggling mechs to them. Now, the guy that runs Swindle is just known as the Warlord. And uh, he doesn't have a name, but he's got this carefully crafted backstory about how he's a poor orphan boy who went to Swindle and fought to defend the colonists. It's mostly fabricated bull, as we discover. But um, he's, he's, he, he's a dictator who rules with an iron fist. Um, and, but Swindle is stuck in the space between several superpowers. All of them want this place, but none of them want to risk it for a war between the others. And as long as the warlord keeps the CX gas flowing, they remain independent. Uh, and so he does whatever he wants. And these guys supply him with weapons. And uh, but when they get there, they discover that, you know, they discover just how bad things really are. And that's when our story takes a very sideways turn. Yeah. And um, the uh, the opponent that they face at first is uh, is the mecca faces these these horrible beasts like um the kinsella <laughs> and the um what are some other names of these things they're uh calibans the Kinsella. and kinsella that's another one of those charity red shirt names i yeah, said he was a scientist. we're not gonna kill you off things. we're making you those nasty monsters man <laughs> Well, they're named after him. He, he was the biologist. Oh, that's that right. Him. That's right. And then got that's right. He did get killed. <laughs> yeah. And then he got, and then they were named after him. That's how we did it. <laughs> oh, man. And then the Caliban. Uh, and then the thing they just straight up called Kaiju, which wound up on the cover of the book. Uh, actually, the description of the monster changed 
in the manuscript after the book cover, after, after we saw the painting of the book cover, we're like, oh, all right, we can make the monster in the book look more like that. <laughs> <laughs> A little retroactive editing there. Yeah, that's a cool cover. Who did this? Let's see quickly. Oh, John, what were the what were the little killer uh, what were those little Dominant. killer bugs that, that that lived in the tree? Uh, what were those called? Uh, the Fifi, the Fifi fought. Yeah. Oh, those were so those were so Wallerts. Wallerts. That's right. Oh, these things are so nasty. Just yeah. Just yeah. Well, nasty. and I think the fun of it was, uh, as Larry said, we wanted a planet that was just nasty. Everything was trying to kill you. Everything was dangerous. It was inhospitable. It's difficult. It's difficult to be there. Um, but there's this very valued and prized uh, substance that's out there. You know, and it, it's interesting now that I think about it, we didn't have this in mind. But you think about the planet Dune in that series. It's it's kind of like that. It's that same like kind of, it's class. not yeah. Dune. I, yeah. This isn't Dune. But it's still that, you know, Dune was inhospitable. It was difficult to live there. And yet there was this prize thing there. So it's interesting that this, this trope yeah. kind of shows up. This feels like well, a, then, like a evil rainforest kind of feel to it. To me. Opposite oh, of Dune. Yeah. It was very pretty. Well, the thing is, it doesn't work like Dune because our place is moist. <laughs> Everything's wet. <laughs> yeah. And poison. Yeah. Um, Oh, and then, and then when the when the, then when the workers go home, though, they fly up to the orbital, which is Big Town, which is basically Space Mogadishu. I mean, it's like so the orbital that everybody lives on, then a couple hundred thousand people live on this orbital, and it sucks. <laughs> it is such a terrible place. It is like this cyberpunk dystopia third world nation of a space station. It's rough. Yeah. Except for the yeah, warlord the guys... has a nice palace. Yeah. Do, do most of the originals, they, they live on the planet or they live there on the space station as well? I can't quite. Both. Uh, okay, so the originals were the first uh, the first people to settle on Swindle and uh, before before the, the harvesters really kicked up. And basically the warlord has shoved them aside. So basically legally the land belongs to them that they're harvesting on, but they've been kicked to the corner. And so we meet the originals as they go into first. Our, our characters think they're a terrorist organization um, that's just trying to sabotage Big Town. And in reality, they're, they're the original settlers who got kicked to the curb by Warlord. Yeah. And so some of them live uh, on the surface and then some of them live on Big Town. But the ones in Big Town have to keep it secret, basically. They're uh, kind of an underground society uh, because uh, Warlord has a pretty ruthless secret police and roots out uh just ruthlessly roots out anybody who conspires against him yeah there's a heart-wrenching scene where we we understand just how you know really evil this guy is in the book when wolf uh uh one of the originals has to face his brother um so the this these are our good guys that that our good guy that our heroes are going to help um if if they can well good Good in quotation. Good in the sense that, <laughs> that they're getting their butts kicked by somebody that's even worse than. Yeah, Swindle doesn't exactly breed goodness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In fact, well, I mean, Jackson's your basic wily thief. So um, he's our main character. Yeah. yeah, our nicest characters are mercenaries. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have a certain code. That's um, right. You know, one of the interesting things about Swindle, I'll just add, is part of the backstory. I don't know that this, I think we might make a reference to this in the book. I can't remember. But part of the backstory was, you know, the, the settlers went out there and they were all just like, crap, right? This is, is total misrepresentation, total fraud. What are we going to do now? Some of them, it was their life savings. So how are we ever going to get out of here and get back? So they were cobbling together these orbitals instead of going down on the planet. And there was a there was a territorial government, but of course in that situation, uh, different factions arose, different gangs, the the government, the territorial government collapsed, and that's when we had all these gang wars. Now this is all just backstory, and somehow, curiously, Warlord came out on top, him and his group, and so that's kind of the backstory. It's been this dog eat dog place since the inception and uh difficult people but and yet 
there are some fun things about it. You know, Larry, when we were doing it, there are a lot of different ways that you can do orbitals in space pl places. And um, uh, Larry's idea was, you know, he's like, ah, I just think it'd be fun if it was like a, you know, like you take a magazine and roll it around in a tube. And if, and if we could see the buildings coming down from up above and it isn't so big that they seem so far away, but they're just right there. So, you know, here you are spinning um, with that. And then you got all these ramshackle, there's no building codes. People are just putting together what they can. You know, you think about those ghettos, those poor places in, in Rio or down in South America, or whatever, where they're just building however they can with whatever materials they can use. That's, that's, uh, that's big town above Swindle. So I think it was an interesting for me, just the backstory and, and knowing, knowing that place and developing that I thought was, was really fun. Of course, you can't put all of that in a book, but it's interesting backstory. It's like a, a third world, literally, that is a third world. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a, it's a cool, uh, it's kind of like, a, and it, if you had mercenaries in a third world country, but in just taken to the archetypical level. So yeah. it's really cool. And your, your climax, you got, you know, you got mechas battling these horrible things. Um, you know, we get how it all comes out. We don't know, uh, but you got mecha battling mecha. Um, it's so much fun to, to that was a pretty epic final fight scene. That was, the action is just uh, even by my standards i'm pretty jaded but that was <laughs> i was pretty proud of that final fight scene it just goes and it bounces back and forth it's 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 great um well what else do we want to say about the book and what are you guys working on now uh well honestly like i said on the book is like i said I, um one thing i like to point out is like a lot of my fans know me from like urban fantasy or fantasy uh this is my first foray into sci-fi Though I have written a bunch of short fiction for various anthologies that are their science fiction, but this is my first novel length sci-fi project, and I I just enjoyed it immensely. I I just had a really good yeah. time. That yeah, was fun. It's action. It's fun characters. It's action. It's in space. We tried to come up. You know, there's some of the standard uh, science fiction ideas, future ideas. We've tried to come up with other twists on those <laughs> on those ideas. But uh, I just had a blast. It, it was fun from start to finish. I think that's the, the main thing. That, that reminds me, though, I need to mail a copy of Gunrunner to Nick Searcy. Because for those who don't know, where Captain Holloway in our head, was, John and I was plotting this, he was like, when you're doing a collaboration, you got to kind of like nail down what a character is like. like. So you pick an actor that you both know to be that character. And so Captain Holloway is just Nick Searcy, like straight up. It's just Nick. So I got to send Nick a book because he's a fan anyway. <laughs> But that's also how the ship wound up being from North Carolina. That's how that yeah. came about. So yeah, yeah. he's got to get a copy. Cool guy. So uh, what are you working on, John? So I've got a series, an epic fantasy series. Um, it's basically, it's called The Drovers. And it's basically, I don't, how, Lord of the Rings meets uh, John Wayne's The Cowboys, I guess is how, how you might describe it. But uh, I'm working on the, the third book in that series, and then I'll do the fourth. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm most of the way through the third book of that. It's a fun little series. And then I might go back and probably do another one of my contemporary action thrillers with that character, Frank Shaw. That's, that's what's in my near future. Very cool. And uh, for, uh, Larry- For those of you, you guys who haven't read John's thriller, uh, the first one I think is Bad Penny, right, John? Yeah. Check that. It's really good. It's really, really good. And there's a, there's a guy named Korea in it who's really awesome. The same. <laughs> Pinto. Pinto. Pinto Korea. Somebody, yeah. It's a distant relation. Does he mean yeah, a horrible he, death or does he's he... He's primo. He's a cousin. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I'm working on, currently right now, I'm working on Monster Hunter Bloodlines, which is the next book in the Monster Hunter series. Uh, that was actually due a little while ago and I blew past the deadline. First deadline I've missed in 12 years. Uh, so I'll have that done in February and into, into band. It comes out in August is the release date. So the, um, and then after that, I have another collaboration. The other, the second collaboration I pitched to Tony Weisskopf when I pitched this one, uh, it's a, a dark fantasy series. 
that I'm writing with a guy named Steve Diamond, who's oh, primarily yeah. a horror writer. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, Tony, you've read Steve's stuff, you know. Yeah, Steve's yeah, yeah. He's, he's dark and fun character as a person too. So oh yeah. I can't yeah. wait to uh, see what comes out of that. And that was kind of a World War One setting with like evil fairy tale magic, and it's 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 fun. Uh, so that, and then I have got a. Uh, uh, two more books in the saga of the forgotten warrior so there's uh two so that that uh, i pitched it originally as a trilogy it turned into a five book series <laughs> in fact tony weisskopf saw that going in because i gave her the overall outline the arc for the whole series and uh, she laughed at me and she said uh, you'll never fit that into three books <laughs> and then sure enough uh because book two and three actually were my outline for book two so that, that's how that goes um and so that's what i've got going on i got another grim war trilogy i'm working on but haven't officially started yet that's just in the outlining process <clears throat> cool 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 so um well uh this one is incredibly fun and i hope that uh, both of you guys delve back into science fiction um at, at some point it's called um it's called gun runner by larry korea and john d brown it's a booksellers everywhere um larry and john thanks so much for uh talking with us about gun runner well thanks for having us Here is another entry in David Weber's Honor Harrington series masterpiece, Uncompromising Honor. Honor keeps her promise. The Solarian League. For hundreds of years they have borne the banner of human civilization. But the bureaucratic mandarins who rule today's league are corrupt and looking for scapegoats. They've decided the upstart star kingdom of Manticore must be annihilated. Uncompromising Courage. Honor Harrington has won the Star Kingdom's uniform for half a century. Very few know war the way Honor Harrington does. So far, hers has been a voice of caution. But now the Mandarins have committed atrocities such as the galaxy has not known in a thousand years. They have finally killed too many of the people Honor Harrington loves. Uncompromising vengeance. Now Honor Harrington is coming for the Solarian League and hell is riding in her wake. And now, David Weber's Uncompromising Honor. Access Boom. Industrial Annex Number 6. Beowulf Alpha. Beowulf System. Yes! Jacques Benton and Ramirez he chew hissed. He'd finally gotten the undersized comm display in the bare-bones compartment tied into the same feed as the far larger display in the Jennifer O'Toole room, just in time to watch the mailed fist of Corey McAvoy's Mark 23's crash down on TF-790, of Vincent Capriotti's 400-plus battlecruisers, 37 survived to cross the limit outbound. He couldn't tell how many of the ships whose impeller signatures had just disappeared might still survive, more or less, as crippled hulks, but he knew very few of the Sollies who'd just attacked his star system were going home again none of which made the casualties Beowulf had suffered any less painful. True, they could have been enormously worse, but what they had were quite bad enough. Bark Chewer's Bane's hiss mirrored his own. The cat didn't have to understand the display's icons to realize what had just happened. And while the two of them might not share honors or Whitehaven's adoption bond, they'd been together quite a while now. He recognized the tree cat's vengeful satisfaction as Bark Chewer's Bane sat on the edge of the bare desk beside him, and he reached out to stroke his friend's silken fur. They put some thought into this, Whitehaven said, leaning against the bulkhead behind Benton Ramirez Ichu and looking over his shoulder while Stimson stood just inside the small compartment's door. Even here, Whitehaven thought dryly, Tobias was guarding his back. There wasn't another chair. This was technically a satellite management station, but from the looks of things, no one had used it in a long, long time which, he reflected, given the state of the lift shafts, which theoretically served it, shouldn't have surprised him. I mean, they put a lot of thought into it, he said thoughtfully, cradling Samantha in his arms as Benton Ramirez he Chu turned his head to look up at him. What worries me the most is that they clearly knew exactly what they were gunning for. If Corey hadn't deployed the inner system block ships, despite the fact that we all knew they were going for Cassandra, it damned well would have worked. 
It's not like we didn't get hurt anyway, I know that. But the truth is, we were incredibly lucky, Jacques. I know, the Beowulfer acknowledged. And you're right, they did know exactly what to target. The question in my mind is how old their data was. I mean, was it from someone that got repatriated after the referendum? Or are they still getting information feeds from right here in Beowulf? Exactly what I was thinking. Whitehaven nodded. On the one hand, I guess it really doesn't matter all that much, but I really would like to know. And if there is an ongoing information flow? If there is, we need to find it and plug it, Benton Ramirez E. Chu finished for him. I'd say that's going to be more up my alley than yours, though. No argument there, Whitehaven snorted. Believe me, all I want to do is get a damned maintenance crew out here to spring us so I can get started on just that. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Uncompromising Honor. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to audible.com and thanks to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz and a fragmentary grenade charged with glad tidings and great joy and a bunch of cute baby alligators, plus thanks, praise, and gratitude to Larry Correa and John D. Brown, authors of Gunrunner. Please join us next time here at the Hammering Art of Science Fiction and Fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. Hey, it's Tony Daniel. I wanted to tell you about something new One Bane author is up to, namely me. Ideas, science, entertainment, outdoors, and travel, writing advice. Have you ever wondered what a guy show like Top Gear would look like crossed with, say, a show about science, science fiction, and ideas. Well, if that seems intriguing, you might be interested in Rulers in Hell, a podcast and community featuring me, Rob Fury, and Bob Kruger. These are all writers who have appeared on the Bain website before and have been on the podcast with us. Rob is a world-traveling scientist, an expert on spiders and arachnids, and associate provost at Harrisburg University in Pennsylvania. Bob Kruger is one of the original writers of EverQuest, Magic the Gathering, and founder of eBook Pioneer Electric Story, as well as a database coder of extraordinary ability who keeps the world working. And I'm me. Watch us perform rescue and recovery on the world of ideas, then handle, we call it the big what if. It's a hypothetical of ginormous proportions that we take on every week. Rulers in Hell is a video podcast, but also it's an exclusive community that I'm inviting you to join. Monthly subscriptions are $3.65, which is the average U.S. price of a medium latte. In fact, every month I'm going to adjust the subscriptions to whatever the price of a latte is in the United States. Come and reign with us. Comment freely on the site, get special reports, and send us big what ifs to expound upon or bloviate upon. The first month is free with promo code Daniel Dollar. So you just put that in and you will get one month free. We launch the podcast next week. So go to rulersinhell.com, rulersinhell.com, and check it out. I think you might like it.